the first first comment. Um, I was very glad that you mentioned loop quantum gravity, and uh, but uh, I would rather reverse the perspective that, that you gave uh, because you said that the problem of loop quantum gravity is the fact that uh, uh, it's not uh, easy to recover the semi-classical limit and in general relativity. I would say that recently the, the picture has uh, changed uh, in the sense that uh, in uh, 2009 uh, John Barrett and his collaborator in Nottingham has proven a theorem, a mathematical theorem, for which uh, the uh, loop quantum gravity transition amplitude uh, has uh, uh, general relativity, has uh, the semi-classical limit. Uh, this is not enough to define uh, a good uh, quantum theory. The, so I'm not saying that this is the end of the story. I would say that the, the problem of loop quantum gravity right now is exactly the opposite, because since the theory recovers so well, uh, so fast, uh, the semi-classical limit, in particular for cosmology, in cosmology, we have a quantum effects uh, in the deep quantum re regime uh, near the, the Planck uh, scale, but uh, the problem is to see these quantum effects, for instance, in, um, in the CMB. Uh, so, okay, so my, my point is that uh, uh, we are more in the, in the opposite situation, that we recover too, too fast the general relativity. My question is the following. Um, so you, you mentioned the problem, you argued about the problem of um, uh, the, the cosmological constant seen as a vacuum energy. And there is this number, 10 to the uh, 55, um, uh, between uh, what we observe and uh, what is calculated. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, this calculation is done in uh, the flat Minkowski space. So, I heard by people like uh, uh, Bob Wald that if you do this kind of comput computation for the vacuum energy in the context of um, curved quantum field theory, uh, the, the problem became uh, uh, much less uh, harmful, let's say. I don't say that they, are, they have completely solved the problem because they have, if I remember correctly, they have still a parameter that has to be tuned but uh, I mean, this seems to recover a, a number that is much, uh, that it's in fact uh, much closer to the cosmological constant that we, that we observe. So I would like you to comment about this. Okay, well, you know, obviously I don't have time to do these, you know, you, these, the kind of the question justice, you know, these are important problems that uh, many people have worked on and many people should continue to work on. I, I, I certainly wish the loop space quantum theory community well and just report uh, the, the problem which over the years has, has been difficult. You know, perhaps it can be overcome. Similarly, uh, many people have made such claims about the cosmological constant and uh, definitely the curvature of space-time enters as a, another contribution. And if you're trying to reproduce a particular non-zero value, then that's important to put that in self-consistently. When you're trying to reproduce this very, very small value, the correction you would then get by adding it back in is, is negligible. So I don't think that in itself is an issue. And again, I, all I really have time is to describe this, you know, the, 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 what, what people feel is, is, is the basic problem that, that uh, the many attempts so far has run up against and uh, you know, why, why it's difficult. So, uh, you know, maybe we'll hear more about, uh, again, you know, they're, they're, nobody's proven that these things are impossible and it would be very important if they were. Next question. Um, I completely agree with uh, your argument about uh, complexity demanding this kind of structure from any fundamental theory and uh, advocating the, the need for solving a Schrodinger type equation. In other words, calculating the answer rather than, than uh, trying to guess the answer. So I, I just wanted to let you know that uh, exactly that approach that, that you uh, were proposing has been done. Where people took the Deneff and uh, um, Douglas <coughs> landscape potential, which is pretty much a white noise type of potential, and solved the Schrodinger type equation for the wave function of the universe. And exactly as you uh, were advocating, you don't find one solution, you find a family of solutions, uh, a very large number of them. And uh, of course, besides the Schrodinger type equation, which in cosmology would be the Will or the Witt equation, 
um, you would have to worry about issues like decoherence, those solutions being entangled to each other. And, and that has been done. And, and decoherence can be induced by um, the environment being super horizon fluctuations, for example. The, the good news of that whole calculation and story, and indeed, uh, everything turns out, after solving the Schrodinger equation, that system turns out to be very similar to, to a spin glass model. So there are very strong analogies with condensed matter. But the, the good news is that uh, since we rely very heavily on, on quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, then by the unitarity principle, the information about that early time of, of uh, this what would be universe is being entangled with each other in that landscape. That information remains. That is not lost. And it can be tracked down in CMB and other observables in the sky. So as a result, there's been a series of predictions that were calculated just by solving that Schrodinger type equation with uh, decoherence included. And uh, I, I just thought you'd like to know uh, four of those predictions have already been tested. Like, and we'll know more. That, that's the exciting part. On Thursday, when we have the cosmology Planck data, we will know whether they will stand the scrutiny or not. The cold spot that was observed by WMAP, the dark flow that was observed by uh, NASA, the dark flow structure, the suppressed sigma eight uh, observed by Sloan Digital Sky Survey and WMAP, and uh, the lack of supersymmetry breaking at Higgs energies uh, also observed by LHC. So well, that um, whole story that you're advocating looks exactly right. Very good. I, <laughs> 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 I look forward to, I don't know, discussion. Other questions or? Just thinking about the analogy of the Schrodinger equation, I mean, it's striking that although there are this you know, comparably vast number of solutions to the Schrodinger equation, of course, we do seem to see that we, we actually seem to see a smaller and rather more manageable set of solutions. And indeed, if we'd just seen that range of solutions and we'd never have seen the same thing twice, we might have found it very hard right. to come up with the Schrodinger equation in the first place. I, I, I just wondered if there's anything interesting to say about what's going on there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, because that's something I didn't say as explicitly as I probably should have in the slides. I think it's, it's a very good point that there is this vast uh, mathematical set of solutions of Schrodinger, and even you know, you, you know, chemical, you could make a lot of them, but in, in practice, you, you, you tend only to see a few, and there, there are clear probability distribution on the planet Earth of what you're likely to see. There's lots of O2, and there's very little UF6 you know, in, in, in the atmosphere, you know, and, then, and so forth. And then there's another different clear probability distribution on, uh, say, you know, the surface of the sun. You know, and, uh, what I, what I take from this is that uh, there actually, you know, you know, there's not like a really trivial distribution like a uniform distribution or a Boltzmann distribution, but there are these distributions that you can understand if you know the physics that generate them. You can't understand them, and sometimes it's very hard, but at least, you know, kind of, you know, why, why is there lots of, you know, water and O2 on Earth and so little UF6? That you can understand, or it involves, you know, the, mostly the nuclear physics, you know, of, of stellar, you know, burning that doesn't produce a lot of uranium and, and fluorine, but uh, many other facts of, of chemistry. So that's one where you could make models and get some distance and decide that, well, yeah, it's a really hard problem. There are you know, questions like you know, the general distribution of uh, isotopes you know, over the universe that are governed by Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So that's actually a more tractable problem because that one people got, you know, you know, obviously they, they didn't do the, you know, I mean, well, I'll come back to that. I mean, you might say that that was sort of done ab initio and people recovered quite a lot of that answer by theoretical models of Big Bang nucleosynthesis, stellar burning, and the like, and uh, that's a that's a more favorable case, and it shows that you need these laws of physics to get some sort of distribution. But in the end, it's it's sort of a discouraging case because uh, nuclear uh, transition rates are are very very hard to compute, and people really did nuclear physics experiments, you know, to uh, estimate them, and that was an essential input. And uh, as far as the string landscape goes, I think it, this analogy convinces me that we need some sort of measure factor, right? So it's an analog of these kind of a priori simplified distributions, in this case, is the measure factor. And it's true, we're only observing this one. That's a philosophically a total difference. But in terms of 
the frameworks of physics and being able to compute things, maybe it's not such a difference. And then you have to hope, well, first of all, people can figure out some rule you know, that, that could lead to a measure factor, which is not immediately falsifiable. But second of all, that we actually could compute it. And uh, so far, I, 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 well, it's easy to throw out possibilities, and this will become clearer at the end of the next talk. So let's come back to the question then. It's easy to throw out possibilities, which very simple, in fact, previously proposed measure factors where we would never be able to compute the answer. And then is it possible to throw out other ones where at least it's sort of possible to imagine computing and understanding it? So let's come back to that. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Um, one of your major motivations was this cancellation, which is so difficult to get. You, you avoid the need for that cancellation if you have a theory where the vacuum doesn't gravitate. And such a theory is unimodular gravity or equivalently the trace-free Einstein equations. And in that case, the vacuum simply doesn't gravitate and you don't have to get a cancellation because it's irrelevant. I forget the answer, but it's in Polchinski's review, I believe. I don't think that works. There's a, another question about the Schrodinger equation analogy. I mean, that nonlinear Schrodinger equation, if we pick our units right of length and energy, atomic units, we can make all the constants of physics disappear from that equation. Well, not the ratio of proton to electron. Yeah, yeah so just the non-relativistic. Uh, well, the, the proton. Well. Yeah, so the question is really, what, what happens in the, in the string case? I mean, are there uh, any invariances, or do all the constants well, yes. sort of remain? Well, yes, string theory is, is, is widely said to be a theory with no free parameters. So it's a longer discussion, but it does lead to that result. So, so is, recover so every, every, every constant as a property of a particular solution. Yeah. So in the Schrodinger equation, you had the thing about, you know, you would have atoms sort of of arbitrary size, as it were, but, but the other properties would all scale. So is this the situation with string theory? You have certain... It's, all, it's a very loose analogy. Again, I, I, I use it to make the landscape point, but uh, the, if, if your, your question is, to, for example, I mean, you're right, this non-relativistic thing, there's no bound on the size of the nucleus and the atom. And, well, you, again, to the extent we're throwing around analogies, there's, there's no bound on the size of the extra dimensions in string theory, and you have to bring in more complicated physics to show why those things are not dominating the measure or why they're not relevant for us. So we, we, can, we, can, we can certainly, may, maybe some, I, 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 think, I think this analogy is a source of fruitful thoughts. You know, that, that's where I would put it. <laughs> 